Hey, what's going on? It's Doug Cunnington here. And in this video, it is my pleasure to interview Miles Beckler. And Miles has been working online for several years and he has a huge YouTube channel, an excellent blog and a podcast. There will be links for all that stuff in the show notes and description. And in this video, we get to hear like about how Miles got started. We talk about some mindset stuff. And the really cool part is Miles is a practitioner. He does marketing day in and day out. He creates videos. He's been successful on multiple platforms on multiple different sites. So it's a pleasure to hear from someone who actually practices what they preach. Miles' YouTube channel has something like 6 million views or something like that. Something pretty impressive, very impressive. And his website's get somewhere in the neighborhood of like over 8 million visitors per year. All right. So let's, let's head over to the interview. Be sure to check out Miles's um, YouTube channel, blog, and the podcast. And thanks a lot, Miles. I appreciate it. Hey, what's going on? Doug Cunnington here. And I'm with my friend, Miles Beckler. How are you today? I'm awesome, man. Thanks for having me on. So great pleasure to have you on the channel um, and in the podcast as well. So for the people that don't know you, can you give a little intro about who you are and what you're doing now? For sure. So in 2003, which as of this recording is something like 16 years ago, um, I was in community college. I was working at my local community college radio station and I always I lived in the Bay Area. Uh, had to cross a bridge like literally six times a day, had to work a job. Um, I've been working since I was 14. My programs director wanted me to spend more time at the college radio station. I was like, dude, I got to make money. He was like, let me show you this little side hustle thing. He taught me how to direct link people from MySpace, an early social network that some people probably remember, to affiliate programs. So I was doing direct CPA affiliate marketing, no list building, no brand building. I was doing it wrong. I uh, worked for a while, made tens of thousands of dollars, was making three, four grand a month extra. Um, and then it crashed down to zero when they sold it to Fox News Corp um, and they changed their terms of service and my links just got banned. Uh, literally went down to zero. So my first big lesson was build email lists, right? Because that would have been an asset that I could have leveraged for years years and years and years, I still could actually be growing that and earning income from that today. Um, then I went through a period of trying many entrepreneurial endeavors, everything from clothing companies before print on demand to real estate investing. Uh, my wife and I met at real estate school in 2009. We co-founded a website in the meditation and spirituality site. This is now 10 years ago. And we went all in on content marketing. This time I remember to build a list. Um, we're still running that business today. It's still the biggest focus. It has made millions of dollars at this point in time. It receives traffic from about 850,000 people per month, uh, visits per month, probably about 500,000 humans per month, um, just to be specific. And then in 2016, so I was making money online for 13 years. I was full time for six years. I started to teach everything my wife and I did to grow the brand, to try to help people to, to avoid that giant pitfall because that was crushing when when it all came imploding down. Um, and so that that kind of like was the genesis of the Miles Beckler brand. Um, I've got 115,000 or so subscribers on YouTube right now, and I've put up about 575 videos in three years time. Um, and now I got a few other things, a couple of case studies that we're doing affiliate niche site reviews, but, but really that's kind of the core of it and the, the process that got us to this conversation. Wow. MySpace, huh? <laughs> yeah, man. That was, you know, I was on Friendster. I grew up in the Bay area and yeah, I learned essentially like if you can connect people with what they want, they already want it. They're already going to buy it. And if you can be the individual who facilitates that kind of moment, if you pre-sell it in the right way to where they take action on your recommendation, and click, uh, you earn income. So it became real for me at a very early time. And I got checks in the mail. My parents were like, where, what are these from? And I was like, this internet thing, like internet money is real. Like it's real. And, um, it, it just all blossomed from there. Right. Once you build that belief and you get hooked on it, I, I don't care if it took me 20 extra years to figure it out. I knew that was my life path in that moment. Amazing. And, and you said, I'll, I'll highlight it here for everyone. So you were making Please. like three to four K in like mm -hmm. early two thousands, which is crazy because I mean like I didn't get into this until just a few years ago and I thought it was like mind-blowing then so you were you were like just coming out of college what, what did you study 
by the way. Uh, <laughs> uh, university studies is what my bachelor's degree was in. So I went to six colleges, like eight colleges over the course of six years. Um, and they were like, dude, you've been here long enough. Here's a piece of paper. And I walked out with $50,000 in student loan debt um, that I promptly paid off in eight months uh, with, with the income we earned online. So for me, college wasn't necessarily, I didn't study marketing. I didn't study computer science. I've never been formally trained in any of this all self-study nights and weekends. Um, but, but the college experience gave me time to a borrow a ton of money to, to think, what do I want out of this life? So philosophically it was really good for me, but the skills didn't really happen in those days. Um, I was playing poker tournaments at night, trying to make a living doing that. It was, it was all over the place for a long time. So if you're there watch or listening and you're like, feel like you're all over the place, that's actually a good thing. That's kind of where we all start. Um, but at some point going all in on something you love that you're like, I don't care what this comes out, what my wife's brand, for example, the meditation space, I meditate every day. Still, I have meditated every day for like 15 plus years. It's something that's added so much value to my life to be able to turn this off and kind of like recenter in the middle of my day. Um, that sharing that became such a big passion, right? That it became almost more of a passion project in the early days that eventually we found some ways to kind of turn it into a business. And, um, when, when you, the, the viewer find that where you love what you do, it's that quote, right? Like when you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. And I'm living proof that that's absolutely true. Very cool. And by the way, did you ever, uh, you know, work a day in a corporate job or, Oh yeah. Oh, you did. Okay. So what, yep, what yep. was that like? How long did you do that? Uh, a lot. So I didn't go to college straight after high school. I graduated high school in 1999 in the Bay Area. So right during the dot-com boom. Uh, so to me, to go to college was crazy, right? Everybody's making so much money in the dot-com era. I was in North Silicon Valley. Uh, so I went straight into the workforce. I've done, uh, my first job was, my first real job, First job was at a pizza place at 14 because I had to buy my own car. I grew up in a very uh, working class, poor family. And then um, out of high school, I worked at a tire store all through high school, busting tires, America's Tire Company, discount tire company. Um, great job. Learned a lot about discipline. Had some really cool managers. Um, out of high school, I sold retail advertising for the Oakland Tribune, downtown Oakland, and then got into sales uh, selling um, crystal oscillators and crystal filters of all things in Silicon Valley. Um, and then I ended up managing a customer support department. So I spent probably probably almost 10 years in the corporate world. And while my wife and I were growing this, um, full-time jobs, literally alt tab, working on some SEO optimization, alt tab, got a phone call, handle the customer situation, alt tab, back to working on my site, um, nights, weekends, we went, we went crazy on it. So I worked, uh, eight hours a day. My wife worked eight hours a day. I had an hour commute each way. So that's 10 hours a day there. I would wake up at 5 a.m. to work for three hours before I had to get ready for work at eight. And then I worked till like midnight. And we did that. Uh, we hit this point in life where I was like, I can't do this anymore. I can't do the grind anymore. And, and instead of freezing up and numbing myself through marijuana and alcohol and mood alteration, I, I went all in to that challenge, that struggle, to that, that frustration, uh, knowing that if we, if we got over a, a proverbial hump, it, it would work for us. Um, and we had, I, I didn't know how to install WordPress. Like I didn't know how to install a theme. I didn't know how to configure a email, like all of that. And, and there weren't helpful people like you, Doug on YouTube teaching step-by-step -step for free, exactly how to do those things in those days, which is a big part of why I'm doing that now. It's my way of giving back to the community, I think. Um, but yeah, it was a, it was a grind to figure it out while a grind to pay for everyday life from a corporate situation. Got it. And I was going to say, I see a lot of parallels from like what you've done and me as well, where I've like, you know, I was waking up at 4 a.m. to get my best hours in before yeah. I went to work. And it felt I like, like I'm going to jump on that. And I appreciate and sorry for the interruption, but I like what you said there. It's so important for the listeners to give my you gave your best hours of the day to you. Right. Like everybody like, oh, wake up alarm clock. I hate this job. I hate this commute, but I do it because I get that paycheck. And once the day is done and I'm frustrated, and I'm tired and I've been through the commute. Now I'm going to work on my passion project. Like that's the time, like after you're just completely deflated versus what you did, get up early, like, like, okay, vital energy. If you need to juice it, hit that coffee hard in the morning, but go. And it's like, literally, I think it comes down to a, how bad do you want it? And you clearly wanted it so bad that you were willing to set the alarm at 4 AM hits and you're in the the mountain time zone. So 4 a.m. in the middle of winter is black, dark, pitch black, moon still up, stars. You got three, four hours of darkness that you're working within. Um, 
I've come to love those hours. I've come to really truly learn that 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 is some of my best work. And I think the buzz of my community is not going. There's this quietness, and I'm able to tune in to like uh, inspiration or intuition maybe a little bit more clearly in those hours. So for people listening, like really like like where is where are your best hours going? Are they going to your twenty dollar an hour job, your fifteen dollar an hour job, or are they going to the business that might change your life forever? And if you've got that mixed up right now. Boom. There is the number one thing I think you could implement is give yourself and your personal business the best hours that you have. Awesome. Yes. And the, we, we diverge in our stories. I, I, I drink beer pretty, uh, I would say heavily, but I'm in. Well, you're in Colorado, right? Yeah. yeah. I'm oh. a home brewer as well. So totally. I, I, I like it. Yeah. You could even have beer in there right now. We have no clue. I'm just kidding. I, I don't know what you're drinking there, but, um, I'll reel it back in. And you, you were mentioning that there weren't as many people to learn from when you were getting started. So like, who was your inspiration? Like, obviously you, you Googled a bunch of stuff, you figured things out, but were there any people that you were like, Hey, th that's my mentor from afar. And I want to, I want to do what they are doing. Yeah. So, um, I was, I dabbled in the network marketing world for a while and I stumbled upon a guy named Mike Dillard. Um, I'm a recovering opportunity seeker. So get rich quick schemes. I signed up for my get first get rich quick scheme when I was like 12. My dad was so pissed. Uh, bought it. It was, yeah, it was a total scam. Anyways, from the penny saver newspapers, um, Mike Dillard in the world of network marketing launched a book called magnetic sponsoring. So he essentially sold an ebook. I think he made $25 million selling an ebook to network marketers who are frustrated with the whole, like, go find three friends and family to join you and then help them find and three friends and family to join you. Um, and that was, that really opened my mind, but I had that early, uh, experience with, with just that, that random dude who was at my college who kind of, he was making cash flow from it and he showed me that thing. So it, it, it became really quite real for me at an early, uh, age at an early phase then following Mike Dillard. And so Mike Dillard is very much into uh, landing page one time offer, which he calls a self liquidating offer. So you run like a Facebook ad to an opt in page. And on the next page, like what's the thank you page, you sell something. And then theoretically, you're going to sell enough of those one time offers to pay for your ad spend. And you create this little cycle, this little system where you dump all the money that you're making right back into more ads. The byproduct is a really big list. Um, so I kind of, I think that was about the path that I followed. Um, but just, man, just really reading the forums back when like the warrior forum was actually a place you could hold a decent conversation um, and really just digging through. And I've met a lot of friends I've never met and some of them disappeared when Penguin and Panda destroyed their their little scheme to hit mm -hmm. page one on Google. Um, Ken Evoy, uh, solo build it, site build it. Alan Gardine back in the day, um, he wrote like associatesprograms.com. A lot of those guys aren't even around anymore or they're kind of retired from the game at this point. Um, Ken McAvoy, uh, the System Club seminar. Yeah, those are a few. Yeah, old school cats. Most people be like, who are these dudes? Like, ah, just stick with Doug and Miles. We got you covered now. Right, well, and I, I was gonna ask you, so it is a, a bit of a minefield in the make money online area. And, you know, you mentioned the warrior forum and there's other areas that maybe they were okay back in the day. And then they've yeah. sort of degraded like their cesspools. That is a, the perfect word. So, <laughs> yeah. so like, how are you staying like above that low watermark there? And like, obviously, I mean, I think you could probably tell, and I could tell people that walk the walk and, and, like talk the talk and all the stuff yeah. versus like charlatans out there. So, so what are yeah. you doing to make sure that you're um, not in that weird group of people that are like, you know, tricking folks? Yeah. And I think it's important to say that I've, I've, there were times when I had no money and I thought that that, that offer, that webinar was actually the magic solution. And I put the like $997 on a credit card that I didn't even have that money. And it turned out to be a rubbish course. And that's happened to me so many times that I'm finally just like over it. And I just don't buy things anymore. People I respect 2000 hour courses. I'm not going to buy it anymore. I don't, there's not that much value. You can figure it out on your own. So for me, it came from a low point of getting that opportunity seeker mindset, right? I thought there was a secret. I really truly thought there was a shortcut. Surprise, surprise. The shortcut is to dig in for three years. That actually is a shortcut because if you jump from FBA to drop shipping and then you're like affiliate marketing and then I'm like, oh, I'm gonna do info products. I'm gonna do membership. I'm gonna do CPA. And you just, every six months you jump to something else, you're never gonna make it. And then you do all six of those for six months each. That's three years. And where are you at? Zero. 
versus one thing. I'm going to promote fancy fountain pens and I'm just going to go all in on fancy pen, fountain pens because I love fancy pens for some strange reason. I'm just going to go all in on that for three years. That actually is the shortcut. Uh, so I kind of went through this process. Now, in, now I see it. I mean, pretty much I will put a blanket statement out there. Anyone flexing in front of the, a fancy car, an Italian supercar, like they are using social psychological triggers to try to convince you there's something they're actually not. And I see it, you can just see it from a mile away, right? Like you might be able to, and this is the kind of shady part of it, is like a three can convince a number one that they've got it going on, but you ain't convincing a nine or a 10. And Doug, you're a nine, right? You get it. You see it and you're like oh, another scammer. I call them fake gurus and they're out everywhere. So they, they're there's a lot of traits. They all follow the same formula. It's the snake oil salesman formula. It's been around since the 1800s and they burn through audiences and they use symbols of status and flash. The funny thing is if you learn anything about wealth, you know that that's a liability versus an asset and wealthy people collect assets. There's a great book out there that I think people could read is uh, The Millionaire Next Door. It's a study of a thousand millionaire families. And so I grew up working class poor, uh, but I lived in a neighborhood around wealthy kids. So I went to high school with a bunch of wealthy kids. I was over at their houses do, working on collaborating on like high school projects and stuff. And I was always like, man, how do they, what's the difference? And reading that book, The Millionaire Next Door, changed my mindset. And it really helped me understand that a lot of those families are actually cash flow poor. They might make $300,000 a year, but they're spending $297,000 a year. At the end of the year, they got three grand in their savings versus the average millionaire from that book. I'll give you one data point. The average millionaire in America um, drives a 10-year-old truck. I thought they drive the Beamer and the Mercedes, right? I thought that, no, those are cash flow. So it's like literally building my mindset around like what is wealth, the rich dad, poor dad kind of ideas and then mix that with observing the kind of sales tactics because you obviously study copywriting. You obviously study the greats and there's always been charlatans and you just the pattern is just on repeat and it's there to use. And finally, I think that like so let go of the belief that there's some shortcut and the shortcut is doing the work and then find somebody you trust and just follow them. Like really, truly follow them. And people you trust should be giving everything you need actionable to make progress on your own without asking you for money because those people are successful. I've got two separate businesses that generate millions of dollars online. I don't need your $900. I don't need your $450. I have businesses that serve a value-based function in our marketplaces that generate my income. So I'm just going to share it with you to give back. I've got some affiliate links in there, right? Um, so it does generate some cash flow for me, but I don't need to sell you the information. Um, it is a minefield, man. Yeah. It is. And it's unfortunate. And it's, it's actually frustrating from my perspective. And that's why I don't run ads on my YouTube channel. Like there are zero ads. Why? Because the fake guru would be marketing to my people who actually want to learn the right way. And for what, 25 cents, I'm going to give your attention to some fake guru who's trying to scam you with a $900.97 scam. Uh-uh. It ain't worth the quarter in my pocket. Again, I've built real businesses around it. And when you realize that's kind of the, the activity that successful people do, like the Jay Abrahams of the world, like he puts out um, amazing, great content for the people. I'll sell a $10,000 per person mastermind where we get together for two weeks with luxury chefs and all inclusive at these mega resorts. I've done that. Um, and those are for the people who I know who are making millions of dollars online. And to them, that's a small deal. Those are the people I'm, I'm selling to because those are the people I can scale to three, five, seven million dollars mm -hmm. per year. Uh, but people are just getting started. You just got to do the work for a few years. Right on. And I feel uh, compelled to, because I have a course that's kind awesome. of expensive, but I was going to say, I give away basically all the information. It's hard to sort through. I'll be right. honest with you. It's hard to sort through. The course is access to me, right? So yep. And, yep. And I, uh, in a lot of cases, that that is what it is. If you look, I'm a big fan of uh, Ramit Sethi over it. I will teach you to be rich. Tons yep. of free content that, that he and his whole team puts out. You could put together a lot of the stuff that they have within the course, but it's like their Facebook group um, and the access. It's access. You could send them an email and they'll read your copy and go over it. So um, yep. anyway, just and, and no, and I want to I want to honor that, Doug, because you're right. And and there are there's a time and a place for selling information. It's a great business model. My wife and I do that in her niche. That's literally what we sell. The the challenge is like how do they decide who's who's who, right? And I think one of the big things is like, has the person taken the time to put out a database or a uh, vault of helpful, actionable, great stuff, or are they using persuasion tactics? So my differentiation is persuasion versus 
versus influence. And I think we're in a very big shift in humanity right now to where the persuasion tactics are getting old. They're getting tired because everybody's doing it. Everybody's putting them into these pressure cooker webinars from these pressure cooker Facebook ads that make you feel like you're going to miss out. And then they've got all this fake scarcity stacked on top. And they have to use all of these persuasion tactics versus what you're doing, which is farming right? You're planting seeds. Every seed, you you till your soil. You're putting out lots of great value for people. And there's absolutely a time for when you, Doug, spend, I mean, I know how much time it takes to put together a course. We do it, we, we put together several courses. I mean, it could take months and months and months to get the slides and get it all dialed and put it all together. And I think for most people, the, the, like when you go into a course and you're like this person, I can trust them. I want the roadmap. I don't have much time because I work the full-time job. It's worth it for me to just plug into someone and go, then you have to stick with it for three years. So like, I'm all about people joining your situation, but then that's it. You have to turn off the, I'm going to buy more stuff unless it's specifically required as a tool for that one business model. And you have to just go in on the business model for three years because there's this there's this group of people who jump from one thing to the next to the next, and there are charlatans who pry on that. And that's the big problem versus actual educators, because I think we live in the age of self-education, which is a beautiful age. I've learned more from videos than I had than I did for my college degree. And I spent 50 grand on my college degree, right? Um, so so it's there's a fine line and I don't, I don't want to feel like, I don't want people to feel like I'm trash talking you in any sense. Um, I do have a hard line cause man, those fake gurus, they annoy me so much that I get all riled up sometimes, but there's absolutely a case for if you really do trust someone and you know that they're real and they've created the result that you desire, go all in on that. But then you have to unsubscribe from everyone else. Anyone else who's sending you, Oh, new webinar, last chance, get off those email lists cause they're distracting you and they're using very deep psychological tactics to insert seeds of doubt that this isn't going to work, that I need this. And oh man, you're right. Email is dead. Oh man, Facebook is dead. Email ain't dead. SEO ain't dead. None of it's dead, right? They're just trying to plant seeds of doubt so they could sell you some other made up solution. Um, Frank Kern recently came up with behavioral dynamic response marketing. And he had an average of $13,000 average sale. And it was this big complex, how you have to retarget and segment everyone at every place. In one of his newest courses, he was like, yeah, I don't do that anymore. I just, it's too complex. Simple works. Just running people through. So he invented this thing to sell it. And then he's like, oh yeah, that doesn't actually work. And he made $13,000 per person. And now he's selling something totally different. And there's this group of people who have to just keep inventing new things to sell you. And and how do you avoid those people and find people you can trust? That's, that's probably one of the biggest challenges for new people. I agree. And I was going to say, I didn't realize how closely we align. Like some of your analogies are exactly. Maybe I heard you say it a couple of years ago or something. But it's like people jumping around. It's like they're making beginner mistakes over and over again in different business models. So they never take advantage of the fact that they made a mistake and now they can not do it again. Um, yeah. Speaking of that, do you have any? Uh, I don't know, like epic blunders or mistakes yeah. that you've made. Do you want Build to share? a list. Yeah, yeah build, build an email list. list, right? Literally build an email list um, and jumping around from one thing to the next. So there was, I did a video on this at one point. I think I, think I counted 13 different failed business things, uh, schemes, you could even call them, that I tried from when that first thing went down and when my wife and I went all in on something. And the mindset was, how can I get money by selling shirts? How can I get money from poker? How can I, I uh, poker chip palace was a site I tried to run at one point selling poker chip set. How can I get money from people selling this? When we got to my wife's brand, it's like, how can I help more people meditate? Because that's going to add value to their lives. And that might seem like a subtle shift, but when I shifted from how can I get to how can I give of myself to this audience, everything lined up. And that's the exact process I use with the Miles Beckler brand that grew way faster than my wife's brand. I mean, it took us five years or so to do on my wife's brand what took me about 18 months to do on the Miles Beckler brand. Because I knew if I went all in on giving everything I know that I would grow my audience of people. And it's that Kevin Kelly, the KK.org idea, um, thousand true fans, right? And and I've got a little membership that I where I coach people. It's just they get to ask me questions and I do some advanced stuff. And it's at about four 450 people. So 113,000 subscribers. It took me three years of doing about a video every other day for three years straight through sickness, through flying across the country. I lived in 20 countries in that period of time. Um, all of that, I'm only half, I'm not even halfway to my thousand true fans still working on it, still growing. And, um, the power of compounding is real. That's the other thing that I think, um, you know, would, so for the viewer, I want to ask you a question. Would you prefer right now a penny that doubled every day 
for 30 days or a million dollars straight away. And a lot of people are gonna be like, mm, give me the mill. But if you go one penny, two pennies, four pennies, eight pennies, by the time you hit day 30, I don't know the exact number, it's like six million or something. And that's the power of compounding because if it keeps doubling and keeps doubling, eventually your traffic grows. And that's what my YouTube channel has done. Um, I caught the flu recently, I was down for like a week and a half, um, didn't post a video for the first, like I went almost a week without posting a video. Still had 12, 15,000 people watching my videos every 48 hours, like clockwork. Why? From all of the compounding value from all of the videos I did before. So really, I think one another way of saying that is, uh, I'm a search engine marketer and I don't love social media. I think social media can enhance a search based approach. But the moment you stop posting on Facebook or Instagram, uh, boy, the countdown is on and you got probably 18 hours or less for the reach on that. If you really hit something that nails it, you might get three days reach off of something. But my video I put up in 2016 still brings in thousands of viewers every month, people into my ecosystem. Wow, who is this Miles guy? He's actually teaching me. Subscribe. Wow, he has a free course. Go opt in for the free. You know, they just, they enter my world because of that posturing um, and because I took the time to really honor, like, what does YouTube want? What does the viewer want? Not what is, what can I get? It's what, how can I give in a way that YouTube's going to love it? Viewers are going to love it. Cause then that will create kind of a, a, a compounding effect of, of value for me, which is kind of the way I'm after it. Awesome. Now you said you had like 500 some odd videos, right? And I went mm -hmm. back, you know, prepping for the interview. I went back to check out your you first, watch my first one. <laughs> yeah. You know what, man? It was pretty decent. Like okay. mine's a train wreck, but I was, I mean, I, I don't know if you were on the radio at, at one point, but like yeah. you, you speak really well and you have a good um, presence and it's gotten, you know, better and better as you've done yeah. hundreds of videos. But like when you started, were you, like, were you thinking, Hey, I'm going to do, um, I'm going to try this out for six months. Did you have a long-term goal? Were you thinking, Hey, every other day I'm going to publish something or how did you yeah. approach it? It's a great question. And, um, I knew for a long time before I started on YouTube that I was supposed to share, that I was supposed to teach. So I was going, uh, we were digital nomads for four years and I would pretty much follow uh, marketing events around the world and we'd just go, so there's a marketing event in Thailand and I'll go live in Thailand for whatever the visa duration is. And then in the hallways of these marketing events, I'd just sit down with people, go to lunch with people and I would just analyze their business, I'd wrap and I would give people these little lightning strike uh, consultations turning people out. I help people go from 10 grand a month to hundred grand a month, left and right from just little tweaks. Of, so I've, I've known that I had this thing where I get the game and I can, I can communicate. I have, I've, I'm a, a fairly effective communicator, but I didn't know how to share. I didn't, I didn't know where I was going to start. It's like the elephant, like, where do I start eating this elephant? Like, damn, like one bite at a time. Well, what, what's my first bite? I was at a personal development seminar by Kyle Cease who used to do stand up comedy. And now he does kind of comedy and transformation two day things called evolve out loud. And at the end of it, he was, he challenged me to do something every day for 90 days. It scared me. And literally that next morning from an Airbnb in Hollywood on a bright red leather couch, I made my first video and it was a review of that event. Um, for me watching that video, it's cringeworthy. Literally, I'm like, oh God. And then the second video, I'm like yelling, <laughs> like literally it's like, ha, ah, you know, just, I'm just awkward. It's so awkward at the beginning. Okay. With all that kind of pre-framing, um, I recommend people do like a 90 day challenge. I ended up doing 120 day videos in 120 days. We always say over deliver for your audience, over deliver for your damn self every once in a while. Right? So I over delivered for me. I did 90 days and I was like, you know what? I'm gonna do another 30. Um, what happened is, do you snowboard at all or ski at all? I don't funny enough. Have you ever like tried yeah. it? Yeah. Okay. Times. There's a learning curve and it's, pretty difficult. And if you don't do it enough to get through the learning curve to where it's fun, it sucks, right? So the first time you go out snowboarding, you're spending on your ass. The second time you go out snowboarding, you're spending on your bum. The third time on your bum. But if you stick with it enough, all of a sudden you're like, oh, I got my toe edge. Oh, ooh, there's my heel edge. And you know, 15, 20, 30, 40 days, I don't know what it is for you. But there's once you get through that learning curve to a point, it becomes fun. Uh, the same thing is true with making videos and same with surfing. Surfing looks so beautiful and you go try it and it's the most difficult thing in the world um, until you do it enough times to where you can consistently do it. So that's I want to condense down the learning curve is the ultimate point I'm trying to make for the audience here. And that's why condensing to do a video a day every day for 90 days. There's a lot of micro muscles. Like if you start working out, you're like, oh, I'm going to build my biceps. There's a lot of micro muscles that are going to have to learn how to hold that weight. And you actually strengthen your wrist. You strengthen your other things. I don't know anything about body. I, I, I'm out of my element here. 
but it's that philosophy. You learn how to record on your camera. I just started using my cell phone. You learn how to get your audio a little bit better, which I got a $30 lavalier microphone. You learn how to get the lighting dialed in a little bit. You learn how to publish. You learn like, okay, title, keywords. Do I put the keyword at the beginning? How do I get people to, you learn all these little things that make you a competent publisher on YouTube. And literally like after my 90 days, that's when I started to get to the good stuff. Um, one of the analogies is you got a garden hose on the side of your house and all winter it's off because it's winter and you ain't going out there for your garden hose and you go out in the spring and you turn it on and that water flows out brown and nasty. You would not want to drink that water, but if you let it flow long enough, the water becomes crystal clear. And the same is true about you and your message that you have for the world. Once you get it going, it will get better. And nobody really looks at your first videos. People do mine. I tell people to go watch my first video all the time because I feel like it's a humbling experience from I'm pretty animated and I'm very comfortable. I was extremely rigid. I was tight. I was, I, I was tense. I was very tense in that moment. And there's just no way to get better than to do it. And finally, um, my wife built her brand all off blogging. She did not start videos. She did not show up with her face on a video for years, literally years, hundreds and hundreds of posts. So if your personality type is such that you're a writer, you're an editor, you love crafting through the written word, which I don't love, I can brain dump ideas in the written word, but like, copy editing and punctuation and grammar, not my strong suits. Take me a long time. I don't enjoy it at all. So I built off of my strength, which is this verbal mechanism of communication, which lends itself very well to podcasting or to YouTube videos. And now I have a team that takes it and puts it into written content. But my wife started with written content and crafted it great. And now she goes back and makes videos to complement all of those for, for better SEO. Ultimately, I think everyone needs, I call it the three pillar content marketing strategy. Um, it's a video, a podcast, and also a uh, blog post on that one keyword phrase, which Doug, I'm assuming there's gonna be some sort of show notes from this. There's gonna be some sort of blog post that has text, plus you're showing up on the iTunes podcast app, plus we're gonna show up on YouTube, boom, all three pillars. And then if you want, do some social for it too, but the core is that three pillar content marketing strategy. And I gotta put this in, caveat, sorry man, I'm just on, I'm on one here. Um, I didn't get all three pillars firing for about a year and three months. I did nothing but YouTube videos. So after my video a day for 120 days, I switched to three videos per week. I was tired, man. I was I was damn near burnt out, which is the enemy. That is, you get burnt out and you stop showing up, your, your game's over in the early days. So I shifted to three videos per week. And that gave me a little bit of breathing room. At six months, I put up my first opt-in offer that did terribly, by the way. It took me three separate total opt-in offers to find something that converted fairly well. Um, it was about a year in when I turned on the blogging machine. I did it a few times and I brought on a teammate to manage it. And a year and three months in, I got a virtual assistant in the Philippines to take my audio, um, edit it, and put it up on my podcast feed. So Rome was not built in a day. Again, I started with 13 years experience making money online. I st I've been full-time as a digital marketer since 2010, six years of full-time experience. And it still took me 15 months to get all of this in place for myself and I got budgets, I got teammates, I, I, I brought all that to the table. So it really just that perspective of like, this is a three to five year plan um, is, is very helpful because then when you're wading through the mud and it's incredibly difficult to go forward because you're in mud, you get to be like, okay, this is where I'm supposed to be. And it's, it's month seven, okay, okay, it's okay, I'm okay. It's not wrong, I don't need to go do something else, I need to keep going through the mud and figure out how to get a little more efficient here. Indeed. In you don't have my show notes in front of you, but like you're you're following along perfectly, man. You're you're like doing these segues exactly right. <laughs> so I was gonna say, yeah, you got you got the blog going on, and I think some of our friends at Content Refine may be helping you repurpose some content a little bit, right? Um, so I took that all in house just because I've got a sure. guy who had some time available. Oh, okay. um, but absolutely, I've done a, a bunch of content with them. Um, it's that whole, like, I, I prefer to have one person who learns my voice and I can go back to this one dude and be like, oh, this isn't right. Why is this not right, Josh? And he's like, God, okay, okay. And eventually he just gets, he understands me so well that the content comes out in my voice versus kind of um, um, an outsourced team. But that was the, where I kind of started to just kick the machine on because, you know, your biggest challenge is someone else's solution. Like that's such a truth in life, right? If you don't know how to do Facebook ads, but you got an offer that crushes it and you know the right, that, there's people out there who are great at Facebook ads. 
if you have an offer that crushes it, right? You don't need to go learn it necessarily. So it was that idea where Content Refined popped in was like, they're great at content. Like, cool, I'm great at verbal content. Let's make this work. Mm -hmm. Very cool. And so you you did YouTube first and that was 2016. Yep. And then yep. you've added in uh, the podcast and the blog. Yep. And on your blog, just curious, did you write the about page or did someone write it? I did. Okay. No. I okay. did. I went off on that. That was a byproduct of an Andre chaperone training I went through and he was like the importance of it. You got to tell stories. And like, I just sat down and wrote it and I just kept writing. It's like, I don't know, 3000 words or something stupid. Yeah. <laughs> so everyone go check it out. I was going to say, um, excellent copywriting there. It's like, Thanks, like, like you telling me the story, like straight up. Um, so yeah, everyone go check that out. I'll put a link in the show notes and description and stuff, but, uh, so you went to a, an event and they that that was sort of the output of the event then? Uh, it was a, a self-study course. I believe it was Andre Chaperone's Lean Business for Creators course. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with him. I really like him. He's a good guy. He's He spends a lot of time. He came out with Autoresponder Madness back in the day. His writing is just so eloquent. I just love – he's great at copywriting. And, um, you know, he's a dyslexic cat from the UK who figured out this game and, like, you know, overcoming odds and challenges and has – he's kind of a – one of his bits is small audiences do great things. And I think that's uh, worthy of noting real quick. Um, so many people are chasing vanity metrics, right? Like, oh, I got 100,000 subscribers. Like, who cares, right? Like, if you got a lifestyle business where you can go give content about a thing you love to a group of people who love it, they take your recommendations, they click, they buy, you earn enough money to cover your family, your health insurance, your 401k. You've won. I don't care how many Facebook fans, nothing like that. That's the, that's the actual metric that matters. Um, so he, he's always scrubbing his list. And I, so at one point I ran an affiliate promotion. My list was 3,500 subscribers. I made 30 grand from an affiliate promotion. I did like three or four emails and one video on it. And it's just proof that small lists crush it. Um, when they know you, they like you and they trust you. How do you get over those hurdles? lots of valuable content. When you help people in their lives, they just, they want to reciprocate. They want to give back. They want to, they, they just trust you flat out. When, when you Doug recommend, this is how to do keyword research. Bingo. They do it. They follow that because they know you, they like you, they trust you, and they know that it's worked for you. And they know that there's a high likelihood it'll work for them. Shifting gears just a little bit. You mentioned you guys were uh, digital nomads for a little while. So mm -hmm. what's the story with it? Like, it sounds like you've settled down a little bit right now, but yeah, tell yeah. me about it. Still quite nomadic, uh, just changing how that works. So we moved around a lot. Um, we met in Albuquerque, New Mexico. We lived on the North Shore of Lake Tahoe, Bend, Oregon for a while. Um, solid beer town, you know, up there, Colorado caliber. Mm -hmm. uh, moved foothills of California, all literally just every three months we were moving, like literally loading everything we owned up. Finally, we were like, well, why don't we move into something that moves? And we bought a 27 foot fifth wheel and a gigantic Dodge diesel Cummings truck to tow it. And we went and wandered and we started wandering that way. And it was kind of cool, but there's uh, some logistical challenges, uh, data for one of those things. And we ended up wintering in um, the Phoenix, Arizona area with all the other snowbirds. We're at an RV park. Everybody's like 80. And we're like in our young 30s. And they're like, what are you guys doing here? And it's like working. Um, I had frequent flyer miles and we flew to Costa Rica for three months, uh, to get away for the winter. And we literally came back in seven days. We sold the truck, we sold the trailer, the mountain bike, everything was gone. Literally fire sale on everything. Seven days later, we moved to Mexico. Um, and it was in that time that I really started to play with funnels, uh, Facebook ad offer one time offer. And that started to click. So I was able to live on in this, like, this place was a piece of art, man. It was a modern, very modern architecture, floating stairwells, all cement, beautiful ocean view in a surf town in Mexico, $900 per month. And it had cleaning service. It had like, it was insane. And we hunkered down there for almost a year and just grinded out. Um, we crossed the 10, 15 grand a month mark at that point, paid off all my student loans. And we were like, this is amazing. Uh, from there, we just started following, you know, it's like, well, how do we do this in a way that makes it almost completely tax deductible? Uh, so we started following, went to Shramco's event in um, Australia, uh, the DCA BKK in, in, in Asia and events in Europe. I at one point took a cruise from South America. We crossed the ocean on the nomad cruise, uh, went to Portugal. So literally cruised across the ocean and, um, then we got tired. We, we kept coming back to Sedona, Arizona. So we picked a place in Sedona. And then I was like, ah, it gets kind of hot. So I've got like 20 acres 
of timber on a lake up in Washington that I spend part of my year at. So now it's like I've got a couple of homes, so I get to go between them, and then we travel in the winter. So this winter, I'm I'm kind of thinking I might go to Asia. We might do Thailand and Bali for a few months when it gets really cold here. So I've still got the nomad thing, I've just built it around some efficiency, right? Like I got a little studio here. This is my work desk, got my lights, my mic. It's always set up. It's always ready to turn on. It ain't that easy when you're just in a random Airbnb that's designed to sleep 16 people in a two bedroom, right? Like there, there's uh, different philosophies in, in play. But, um, you know, Tony Robbins says we need we need certainty in our life in order to feel comfortable and we need uncertainty in our life. So it's like, how do we balance that for ourselves? And this is kind of what my wife and I have come up with at this point. Very cool. So what do you do? You said you have a place up in Washington as well. So what mm -hmm. do you do with the, the places when you're not there? So the we're gonna we're working on turning them into Airbnbs uh, to kind of participate in the sharing economy on the other side, um, and then we can kind of block out the times that are perfect that we want to be there, and then um, yeah, so it's it's been a a process getting to that point, and it's it's a it's another business, right? And that's why we didn't do it right away. We treat it like a business. It's so many people once you 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 learn how to build websites and this, you you're like, I could make a website about anything. I could do businesses on everything. I can make businesses about pens. I can make business about mice. I can make business about microphone, like everything. And that's a big danger zone, right? Because it's focused on the one thing that's really the key. So we feel like we're at a point right now with our business and our team that we can take that on. And um, yeah, so the idea is have a tropical place, a desert for the fall and spring place, and then a summer place up in the mountains on a lake for paddle boarding and stuff. And then we're able to enjoy all of them while still being cash flow positive. Uh, other people pay off the mortgages and, and that way they're assets and not liabilities is the ultimate goal. Perfect. That's beautiful. I love the diversification where it's like really outside, like really diversifying. Because I hear some people, they're like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start another website based on the same traffic and monetization. And it's like, that's not really diversifying. That's just like another thing. So. And, and it, it is good to, to invest in what you know, right? Like there, there absolutely is that side. So, um, you know, my wife and I, we now have like three main brands. We're working on a fourth. I'm kind of working on a, a niche site division, if you will, of my company to start building them and growing them because it can work. But at the same time, yeah, I, I do move things into much more traditional uh, filling up 401ks and doing all trying to adult, right? Because my 80 year old self probably won't want to work 16 hour days. Just guessing. Maybe he will. And if he does, great. We'll be crushing it then. But if he doesn't, um, I want to make sure that there's a, a solid uh, plan in place for that as well. So in the hours I work today, I'm all about, yes, pay for the lifestyle I want to live now. But also, how do I uh, act responsibly with the monies that I'm creating so they can go multiply themselves uh, for my 60-year-old, 70-year-old, 80-year-old, 90-year-old self? Hey, and what if we start living to 120 years old, right? Like, I think that's possible. And no one's planning for like none of the mainstream retirement things are ready for human beings to start being like 120 to 140 is average. So um, I'm yeah. digging in. Uh, yeah, every, everybody start planning for that. But it could I, it really could. It could happen. I mean, uh, we're, we're better a, chance now than in my dad's generation. Right. That's for sure. Yeah. And I see you're drinking water. That's good. Well, you know, stay healthy. Um, water and tea right now. Water and tea. <laughs> so. And I think we're, we're going to talk about some niche site stuff in a second, but I want to digress um, just a bit. Uh, nice I think open one loop. of your other videos, you know, you mentioned some very beautiful places um, mm -hmm. and you mentioned hiking and being outdoors. Like, what does that mean to your like day to day life? Is that yeah. a priority? It is 100%. Uh, it's it's required for sanity in in the world of Miles Beckler, Miles and Melanie, my wife too. Um, we are addicted to time and nature. So I meditate every day. Usually that comes in, I would say, about the two o'clock hour. It's when I'm like tired, kind of lethargic. I'm not putting out my greatest, best content. I'm just sluggish. That's my meditation time. I do a two, a little over two mile loop in the morning. It takes me about 45 minutes every morning. So I wake up, I have a cup of matcha, green tea. I do probably an hour, hour and a half of work, bowl of cereal, and then I'm out for a two mile loop. And then in the evenings, usually after that meditation, we often do upwards of four mile loops. So I can hike easily four to eight miles a day. Um, when I'm here up in the other places hiking, you can't hike in some countries like go to Bali. Good luck hiking. Uh, you can't even walk down the streets. There's no sidewalks or anything. So we always mix up how that manifests, but we have found that time in nature, it, we mastermind a lot, but it just clears the head. If you're just sitting, trying to force it, 
all day, trying to force it, trying to make it work. Sometimes letting go for a little bit is actually the best thing. And you see this in everything in, um, traders, like, like, uh, stock traders and stuff, day traders, like when they're getting bad, when they're having bad decision after bad decision after bad decision, generally speaking, a psychologist who works with traders is going to say, take a two week vacation. And their answer will be, I can't, I need to make this work. And then the follow up is, well, if you don't take the vacation, you're going to keep making stupid decisions and you're going to lose all your effing money. Oh, and then they take the vacation and something happens when you just let go. Now, that's not for everybody. For some people, uh, playing guitar, right? Just riffing on that. That could be that form of letting go. Yoga classes could be it for some people. Whatever it is, there's that kind of like surfing for some people. There's that just, you're not thinking about it. You might think about it a little bit, but you kind of try to let go of it and you just let go of things. Um, what I think we do is we open ourselves up to new creative ideas and new creative solutions to so those aha moments. And those things are really what can set things forward. And it also prevents us from hitting the, um, the, the total kind of, um, burnout point, because again, burnout is, is probably the number one enemy I think right now. And, uh, so it's, it's like energy management is what I would call it. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say again, very, very close and very, a lot of parallels. Cause I I'm walking roughly the same amount. I'm walking the dog often, but I'm in uh, the Boulder, Colorado area. So, you know, the flat irons are over. Have, have you been to this area before? Up, up through, not into Boulder proper, okay. but, um, I all up 25, 50, 70 sure. up and down, up and down for sure. My wife went to school in Greeley actually, which isn't too far okay. away. My cousin, cousin went to UC Boulder, UC okay. Colorado Boulder. Yep. Very cool. Yeah. So I was going to say I'm outside walking probably five to eight miles a day, like almost Beautiful. every day. So, um, okay. You are doing a niche site case study and I think you're a I few am. months in, um, yep. can you kind of lay out the premise of what you're doing? Yeah. So, um, there's two levels to it. Uh, level number one is as an investor, straight, pure investment. Right. And, um, I've done real estate investing. Obviously, I'm engaged in that a little bit right now. My wife and I met at real estate school, so I've, I've have had experiences in real estate. Um, so looking at the numbers, right, if I was to get a rental property, it would take $50,000 down and da-da-da, and the positive cash flow would be this, and the asset value would be that, okay, current data driven. Then, well, what if I put that $50,000 into a niche site? What would the cash flow be potentially from that niche site, and what would the value of that asset be when it's generating said cash flow? And based on the numbers, I think putting that 50 grand towards an affiliate site was a better decision for me. Now, why 50 grand? That's one of the things we were like, God damn, wow, 50 grand. I'm not touching the thing. Like I come up with the idea and it is 100% outsourced. Just like if I was to get a rental property, I am not painting that thing. I am not redoing the carpet in that thing. I would outsource everything. I'm not managing it. I'm not finding the renters. And if the water heater blows up, and that's the cool thing about a website is, although things do go crazy on websites, you don't have toilets, you don't have termites, you don't have water heaters and roofs and things to go wrong that can be, oh, by the way, you need a new roof, $12,000. Like, oh gosh, that sucks. So it, it, that's level one of the idea. Level two is you know, my wife and I both have personal brands based on things we love. My wife is the face of a brand. I'm the face of the Miles Becker brand. It's my freaking name. So there's a segment of my audience and probably your audience that are like, well, what if I don't know what I'm passionate about? And what if I want to kind of hide behind my computer and don't want to do it? And so that's the other level is I can show people that you can just kind of randomly choose. And, um, you know, the HPD guys. Uh, so I literally, I was in the back of an Uber and going to a speaking engagement to teach, um, Facebook ads to this group of entrepreneurs. And I bought a site from their site. Cause I was like, well, how am I going to choose a niche? I don't know. So I told my guy who's my project manager, like find me a site that's reputable that I could buy a website from. And I looked and I scrolled and I was like, eh, I kind of know a little bit about those things. We'll take that one. And I just want to show that you can kind of like go all in on and do everything yourself. So I think, although I'm willing to spend 5,000, I think most people could do it for 500 bucks if you really want to grind. And I'm talking that's for a whole year. That's the keyword tools. Like that's the hosting. That's the theme, everything literally for five. And you could generate about a $3,000 a month, um, cash flow on that. So that's my goal. 50 grand in three grand a month cash flow out. That would mean it's worth about $90,000 with a 30 X multiple, which I should be able to get for. Um, and that to me was worth it. So those are the two layers I'm operating on. We're four months in, we're behind schedule. It's harder than 
we expected. I'm wondering why I'm starting all over from zero again, but it keeps me sharp. It keeps me on top of the game. It keeps me really close to uh, what what everybody's dealing with, right? That I don't want to become the guru on the hill. I, I hate that. Like people are regurgitating things that don't work anymore. How do I know they don't work? I'm a practitioner day to day in it. I'm in the nuts and bolts doing Facebook ads, funnels, SEO, all this stuff. I'm, my fingers are dirty cause I'm in the dirt with it. Um, and so it keeps me sharp on that side as well. Um, it's fun. I like challenges. I like building things. Um, that's pretty much what I got on that one. Right on. So quick summary, you're going to spend 50 K over the course of about a year. And yep. then, um, the goal is to have three K per month. And then obviously the evaluation at that point, about 90,000, give or take. Give or take. Yep. And, and we're, we're probably not going to hit the spend on that. Um, the content machine, we've been, it's just been challenge after challenge. And one of the ways I'm looking at it is I'm trying to build systems because again, I want this one website to essentially create a factory. Like I'm looking at like a factory, my project manager, we always have this analogy. It's a factory ideas and keywords come in great content that ranks on Google comes out, clicks to Amazon or the byproduct of that. That's essentially so that what are the different stations in the factory? If it was like a Tesla factory, you got the frame and then all of a sudden the engine, the motors come on and the batteries go like it's all we have. And so everything we're doing, we're, we're zooming out and we're looking at it from this kind of a process driven approach or systems driven approach. So once we dial it in, we can then go create three, four, five of these things, um, which by default, the reason, the fact that I'm, I'm so focused on the systems, it's slowing me down from putting out content. Uh, and I think somebody who is doing it on their own could be farther along than I am. Um, but, but there's layers to why I'm doing it right. Um, got it. It's tough, man. And it's tough. You, you should go to my website. I have templates for all the stuff that you just said. So, Brilliant. Yeah. I'm yeah. all so, about it. All, all the, all this, I could just send it to you. You don't have Perfect. to sign up for the email. List. Perfect. Yeah. And, and that's, that's really it. And I think when people realize that, that you get the right few systems in the right places, the byproduct of that can be an audience that's growing quickly, who know you like you and trust you. They give you their email address in exchange for something cool and they take your recommendations, which means they buy the things you recommend, whether it's your product or others' products, and you get income. People want the income and you just got to realize that the income is the last domino in a line of dominoes. What are those other dominoes? Doug has all the templates for you. Follow it, right? So you kick over that first domino, which for us, keywords, content, keywords, content. Like that's just keywords and content, keywords and content, keywords and content. And then you got to make sure optimize little bits and pieces here, but that's what ultimately kicks down the, the, the row of dominoes. Um, and the byproduct of that theoretically is going to be income, which I have no doubt it'll work. It's probably going to take longer than we expect, be more challenging than we expect. It's going to cost more than we expect. And that's fine because ultimately we're, we're building assets and, and we're, we're, that's it. Build assets, collect assets. Yeah. And, um, one thing I'm curious about, so you're about three, four months in right now. Four months in, haven't done my month four update yet, but, but we're ready. So how much content do you have out there right now? And I'll, I'll point people towards your videos and stuff so they yep. can get the full rundown. Yeah, I think we're, I think at month four, we're up to 30 posts right now. Um, but I think what, what's really cool is we're, we're hitting the three posts per week mark, which has been our goal. And just last month, we barely got to two posts in a week. Um, and again, the machine, we had some problems with the content people and it came back and then we had to like re-edit it and it was an order of 12 pieces of content. So, um, start small when you, when you invest in new teams, buy small amounts, make sure it's going to work, uh, is the big lesson there. So yeah, we're, we're sitting about 30. My goal is to have something like 120 to 150 posts by the end of the year, which would be about one every third day, which is, you know, that, that three per week is kind of what we're, we're shooting to get to. Okay, cool. And all while, if I want to throw this in, just because, um, the miles Beckler site is still growing by two blog posts per week. My wife's site still grows by massive amounts of content and we're going back through old content and optimizing it and re-upping it as well, all with the same teammate, right? All with the same team. So it's, yes, this thing's going, but remember I got two other businesses, right? My side hustle has a side hustle at this point in time. Um, and, and we treat it as such. So we're still keeping all of the plates spinning, I think is the gotcha. idea. And I'll, I'll mention one thing that could be a little helpful and then we'll continue on with it. It'll give you a chance to drink some water there. Um, so I, I'm doing sort of a similar case study. A couple pieces are different, but um, I, you're road trippers. You guys like to be on the road, it sounds like, or at least at one point in time. Um, so earlier in the summer, I drove up to Alaska from here. Have you guys been, did you guys ever make it? No, I haven't done the Alcan, man. It's on the list though. It was awesome it was super awesome you know 
North America is a very big country. Um, and it's, yeah, it's just huge. Anyway, Gorgeous. I, before I left, I was like, Hey, I want to like buy a site from human proof, uh, outsource a bunch of work to be done before I leave. I tested all the vendors before, <laughs> before I left, um, to make sure they were good to go. And then I left for about 30 days. And when I came back, I had like 50 posts like published and good to go. Um, and I, you know, I probably should do be a little bit more hands-on, but it's really nice to just like outsource it. And then I've, I perused a couple articles. It's good enough. And yep. then like, we're, we're just moving on. So, yep. um, it's beautiful when you can like clean your hands of it, outsource it and just, you know, trust that the system is going to work there. Yep. So. And, and I think, you know, with SEO, I, I've made a video called the shotgun SEO method. And, and essentially what, what we want to do with our websites is we put up enough content to where Google's like, okay, of those 50 posts, I think you're relevant to these. And then you go get the, the data from Search Console, and you can see where all your impressions are coming from. You can see where all you know what what queries are actually bringing impressions and clicks, because it ain't going to be from all fifty of them, right? It, Google's going to really just start to assign relevance to you on something, and then we go deeper on what's working, and we just kind of like let it create this open loop where where Google gives us the data of what Google likes, and we're like, cool, it likes this silo or this bucket of content. We'll do more posts over here. So like a big blast of fifty is great because then it seeds the algorithm. You get to just see what kind of starts to work and, and work through and you can improve things from there. And um, there's a lot, you know, I, I like to tell people it's it's a million little things, right? And people think that building a successful business is one big thing. Overnight success, you hit it out of one viral thing. I never had a video go viral. I never will have a video go viral. But guess what? I'm growing like crazy. I got my silver play button. I'm still like, it's making a ton of money and it's giving value to lots of people because it's the little things done, split testing my titles, split testing my thumbnails, all these little things that I'm doing give me all these little incremental improvements when added up together make something big. Um, and that's, you know, I think the, the 50, what you did is essentially like a 50 day challenge. You just outsourced it and went on the road and got it done in 30 days. Yeah. It's expensive, but you know, I had the freedom of, uh, you know, being disconnected, which is, nice. and you probably started by doing all of the work 100% yourself. Right. And okay. a lot of people are like, miles, why don't you start another site and do all of the work yourself? You know, cause my time's really valuable. Like I don't even sell hours at a thousand dollars an hour anymore. I could, I have people want buy an hour console. I don't have time for it. So there, there comes this point where we do elevate and that what's cool is there's this room for these new groups of people to, to start following your stuff, document the process, get it going in, and, and you'll learn by doing one thing I've found of I don't think documenting the process is a great model. It's something Gary Vaynerchuk really uh, – document, don't create. Um, it, it can be good in some situations, but nobody wants to watch somebody be bad at something. We want to watch pro surfers drop dope waves. Like we want to watch snowboarders like float it to the point where we're like, oh my god, that human being is flying 350 feet in the air. This is nuts. Is he going to die? Oh, my. You know, That's what we want. That We don't want to watch you trying to learn how to snowboard. But – the main caveat here and the way – the reason blogs are a thing, web blog, blog, is because it gives you an opportunity to when, – when we teach things, we learn at a deeper level. OK, so I'm I have been relatively sloppy with my funnels, my ads, kind of sloppy in my approach works, but it's sloppy. When I start to teach people how to run Facebook ads, I got to get in and get a little bit more meticulous. I got to get in. Why do I do that? Why do I do that? why the hell am I doing that? And then I do something different. And so if I'm going to teach you a process, I need to make sure my process is dialed. So there's a little benefit from that in, in kind of like logging, blogging, uh, doing a web log of your process, but I wouldn't expect that to be the thing that gets you there. I think that would be a great thing for you to do to stay on top, to keep yourself accountable, to have that roadmap that you can go back and follow and be like, damn, I've come a long way. And eventually it could be something cool, but you got to go core all in on, you know, who's my audience? How can I give them value? Right on. Very cool. And we'll start winding down here, but you were talking about your team and the team is yeah. supporting like a few businesses. What, what does mm -hmm. it look like? How, how did you develop the, the org mess. structure? Okay. Yeah. I can um, help you with this stuff, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> and well, so want. I, I'd like to say it's a lot better now. So we have 25 people who work in some capacity with us and for us. Um, I think four of them, five of them are full-time with us. 
Um, so at this point I have my Lieutenant and that was the thing that I didn't build at first. And when I say my Lieutenant, I mean kind of like my go-to person. What we notice in businesses is, is we often become the bottleneck. My inbox was a bottleneck. I think you and I, I think like even to make this, uh, work, this podcast, I missed that email and it took a, like, I, I lagged and get it back for sure. Um, because again, I'm the bottleneck in a lot of things. So how do I get someone who can kind of buffer me from all of the stuff? Now in the early days, when we only have my wife's business, she's talent is what I called her. I come from the radio kind of world, right? So she's the talent. I deflect her from everything, customer support, questions, comments, every, she doesn't, all she does is create content because she's the talent. And then customer support was one of the big things we pulled off of us. We got some virtual assistants in the Philippines who were absolutely great, but they reported directly to me in those early days. And then I got a developer to help us with all of our CSS and all that stuff that I hate dealing with. Um, and he reported directly to me. So the way my org chart looked at first was Miles, Melanie above, and then lots of people who reported to Miles. And what I've been working on at this point is, uh, so my lieutenant, another way of calling him, it would be a chief operations officer. And he's kind of my, op now he's in the middle of a lot of the different things. Um, and I've, I've used systems and technologies to flat out remove questions from me. Um, like my customer support, if, if somebody is having a bad experience, give them anything of ours up to a hundred dollars and don't even ask me, like, just make it right. Give them, give away a hundred dollars worth of content. Cause what does it cost us to give digital downloadable stuff? It doesn't cost us anything. So just finding ways to just make the customer experience better through automation and leveraging others has helped a ton. Um, and a lot of those 24 people are on demand, very on demand. Like when we have a book, I have a book layout guy, I have a book editor. So we have people, and we don't do books all the time. We've got like five books or six books out. But um, so um, that's what I got. And I think Building a team, growing a team of people you can trust is absolutely one of the biggest things for uh, freeing yourself to do the most important part. There's So you know the 80-20 rule, and I'm assuming your audience knows the 80-20 rule. So it's 80% um, of your results come from 20% of your efforts. Well, the cool thing is you can do the 80-20 rule to the 80-20 rule. Okay, So what I mean by that is you can take 80% of 80%. And you can take 20% of 20% because 80, 20, that leaves you with four and 64, which means 4% of what you do creates 64% of your results. You're seven, six points away from a C and C's get degrees, right? So ultimately when you look at all the activities you do in the day, you could probably ignore most of it. You could pass it off and get it kind of done well enough, like you did with the content. It's like, ah, eh, that's not great. I wouldn't have done it like that, but that's good enough and still make progress. And that's really the, the underlying philosophy of growing our team and, and structuring our team is how do we eliminate the things that are repetitive and how do we give Melanie first was key. How do I give her 100% freedom that all her time through the day, all 12 hours is focused on that 4%. Only she can do that. Now it's like, how do I get that for myself as well? Which has been kind of adding more layers to that org chart at this point in time. Cool. Yeah, it sounds like you got it under control where you can like delegate to one person. The COO takes care of everything. And then it gets done. It's awesome. And is that yeah, person, then, uh, oh, sorry, is that person remote, I take it? He is in Springfield, Missouri at this point. Uh, somebody who literally reached out in a comment, literally came from my actual channel, just some dude who was like, I'm going to work for you for free, was literally how he started. And it was like, what? Well, okay. And uh, so he started with in one capacity and we've been together for a few years and um, almost let him go a couple of times. It, it was it was rough for a while, right? Like hiring people, training people, getting people to show up and, and to work. That, that is one of the biggest challenges because it's not data. It's, it's like emotion. There's all kinds of stuff in there, um, but it's worth it in the long term to uh, go through the time and the energy required to get someone who is I mean, he's, he's like, he's an S dude. He is an SEO samurai at this point. He gets SEO. I've taught him everything. And eventually he's going to fly the coop and he's going to build his own thing. And that's going to be great. I look forward to that point in time, but until then we are optimizing everything uh, and it's awesome. Super cool. So people could obviously go to your YouTube channel, miles. Where else do you want them to go? Uh, literally, you can just search for Miles Beckler, right? Like I'm the only Miles Beckler in the world. I have a unique name. I was blessed uh, by my parents. Thank you, mom and dad, for figuring that one out. But yeah, I'm most active on YouTube in the comments, to be perfectly honest. Uh, I got blog posts and things. I will say that that if you're on a video and you're like, this is great, I need to learn how to do this, um, 
oftentimes I have these really long step-by-step posts on my site. Some of them, like I got a local SEO one, uh, how to set up Google My Business. It's like seven or 8,000 words. So, so I do these mega posts that are just step by Facebook ads, how to run Facebook ads. It's just step by step by step. So if you're looking for that kind of stuff, it's on my blog. Um, I'm rarely on social. I think it's a waste of time, but I got a fan page and you can pop in and say, Hey, but I'm, I'm like never on Instagram or Facebook. It just, it keeps me from doing my 4%. It's not in my 4%. Yeah, that's right. I, I'll be honest. I look at some uh, Instagram pictures every now and then, but yeah, I'm I'm largely non-social. Yeah, yep. It's yep. Just a- We're search people. That's it. That's why. Yeah. That's why we connect, my man. <laughs> Thanks, Miles. Really appreciate it. And um, sure. everybody, check check out Miles' stuff. Thanks for having me on, man. Appreciate it. Thanks again to Miles Beckler. Definitely check out his case study. His videos are linked in the description. I'm not sure you know, when you're gonna be watching this, of course, but he could be pretty far along uh, with a case study. And I'll also put links for my case study as well. So thanks again to Miles. Again, YouTube, podcast, and his blog. Go check out Miles' stuff, really smart guy. Appreciate it, and we'll catch you on the next video.